Okay, well, welcome to Sirius Community, a small eco village in the western hills of Massachusetts. Uh, we are an eco village and a spiritual community and a um, educational center. So, if you'd like to come in, we could start with a short meditation together. Shall we enter? <laughs> So while you're sitting, then why are you still comfortable? Okay. Maybe we'll do a little discussion about um, the importance of communal spaces. Well, within the community, there are you know a lot of private houses. People even have their own private kitchens, and there are a number of places that are more shared. But um, I think it's really important to have a, a communal space where people can get together, share meals together, have meditations together, do dances, music, all those things I think lend themselves well to a um, socialization of community. And if you're trying to work together to do something that's useful for the planet and other people, it's also very important to have places where you can have fun together. I think joy and the upliftment and just the sharing and that, that sort of joyful feeling that you have when you're together with people of like mind is an essential ingredient of creating a dynamic um, functioning group process. So having these collective spaces where people can come together, meet together, be together, like in the greenhouse, there's a dining space in the winter, it's nice and warm, there's green things growing, in this octagonal building where it lends itself well to people coming together in circles and, and being uh, together that way is, is very critical and very important aspect of community. Um, but how do you guys manage, like, keeping clean, you know, <laughs> well, that kind of stuff? this particular one, this is our main community center, so we, everybody has a cleaning task that they do. All the people who live here are required to take on a task that they do maybe once a week or once every other week. Um, and that's part of how we do it. And we also have a guest services department, and they have somebody who also comes in and cleans the guest spaces on a regular basis. So we share it. We share the cleaning together. and. Uh, we also hire people to clean parts of it too. Main dining room. The building is a passive solar uh, design. It has uh, super insulation in the walls. The walls are nine inches thick with blown in cellulose, which is ground up newspaper with a little boric acid added for fire retardant. We have a passive solar greenhouse out there, which we can go look at in a minute. And this is a, um, a masonry heater here that uses a fraction of the wood that a normal uh, wood stove would use, and it has a lot less toxins coming out the chimney because it goes through a series of flues and uh, things that burn up a lot of flue gases. And you only have to light it once a day and then it absorbs all the heat and then just radiates all that heat back through the masonry mass of the stove itself. Um, and it's basically modified post and beam. Uh, we built the building ourselves over a 10 year period. Um, and we ended up having a building with no uh, bank loan on it, so. And, and what are the walls built on? The walls are, uh, concrete block on the inside because we have an assembly hall on the second floor and we had to do that for fire code. But outside of that, there is a wood frame wall which is filled with the uh, cellulose insulation, nine inches thick. So all that thermal mass stays in the building. So once it heats up, it stays warm for many days, even without a fire going. What is the cellulose from? Ground up newspapers. Oh, newspapers. With a little boric acid added for uh, fire retardant. Yeah. So this is our uh, yeah. community <laughs> kitchen. Your name was on the um, also passive solar, you got nice big windows here. We have over here, we have a wood uh, cook stove. This is our wood cook stove. Uh, it heats and bakes. Uh, we do have gas, but we encourage people to try and use the wood stove as much as possible. Because nobody likes to do it in the summer because it gets a little warm. It also heats hot water. And over here, we have a um, large walk-in cooler which uses a third of the amount of electricity that a normal walk-in cooler this size uh, uses because we built the walk-in cooler ourselves and the walls are super thick with our really amazing insulation in it. So, you know, part of our commitment is to, you know, how do we reduce our ecological footprint and use the least amount of uh, energy as possible. And this is one of the things that we did with the, and we found the store at a salvage yard. Um, so there you go. And there's a little bakery here too. So we do uh, baking and food preservation, drying food, storing food. We have a root cellar um, and happy cooks here, cooking lots of stuff from the uh, 
garden. The community center that we built, we ripped out a lot of old barns that were falling down in the local area. These are all hand-hewn chestnut beams that we reused from those barns uh, out of a uh, barn that was built in the 1700s. Um, and we have um, composting toilets over here. And um, the reason that we got involved with um, composting, somebody in there? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> The reason we got involved with composting toilets is because the flush toilet is an ecological disaster. You take perfectly good potable drinking water and you mix it with human waste and you put it in a concrete box and then you pump it out of the ground, take it to a treatment plant where they douse it with chemicals and tons of energy and then you dump it in the landfill. With composting toilets you eliminate all that, you keep the water out of it and in a two-year cycle, you can compost the uh, solid waste and actually use it as a resource rather than a waste product. Um, you do have to be careful because uh, you can spread around disease, but if it's composted well and done well, then none of that becomes, product, becomes a problem. And uh, it's, it's a huge problem all over the world is what to do with human waste. And rather than have it be a, um, a waste product, you can just turn it into a resource. And that's what we've done here. And the urine, urine is basically sterile, and it can be added to wood chips and other sawdusty kind of materials, and it helps break it down because it's very high in nitrogen. And we add nitrogen to carbon material like sawdust or wood chips like that. It, it, it speeds up the whole decomposition process really greatly, and that's pretty much what we do with it. So rather than having a waste thing, now we have this great resource here. Okay, so this is our um, passive solar greenhouse. Um, as you can see, we grow lots of food here. These are all uh, hot weather crops. These come out, and then in the winter we plant crops that can tolerate a little cooler temperatures so we don't have to keep the temperature of the greenhouse up. And it does a lot of things. It, um, actually, in the winter, it generates heat and helps heat the dining room. So we also have it as part of it as a dining room. So in the winter, you can be out here with all these beautiful green plants, even when there's snow outside. It also collects water from the roof. This, um, this whole thing on here is a cistern and the water from the roofs goes into the cistern and then we pump it out of the cistern and we use it to irrigate the whole greenhouse. Um, and we do have a wood stove in here. Usually in the course of a winter we only have to crank it up one to three days during the whole winter to keep it above freezing. You know, just the sun itself heats this place up because there's a lot of thermal mass, all this concrete, the soil and the water and everything holds, holds the heat in. And this is an uninsulated wall to the dining room so when uh, the sun is out, this actually helps heat the dining room. In any good permaculture thing, you want something to do at least three functions. So it's a food production area, it's a dining room, it collects water and also helps heat the dining room. So it's a post and beam uh, system. And we have a, a fig tree down there that produces lots of uh, edible figs. And we have a little frog pond in here. It gets filled up from the cistern. Once the cistern is full, it overflows into the frog pond. And once the frog pond is flowed, filled, it overflows into those two beds with perforated pipes in it and actually irrigates the uh, beds themselves. And the idea of having it here, it actually breeds uh, frogs and toads, and they come out and they eat a lot of insect pests that might um, come into the greenhouse itself. So how much of uh, your own food are you able to kind of consume while you guys are here? Uh, obviously, there's different numbers in summer and in winter, but... yeah. Well, we have very large um, gardens too, organic gardens. We run a small in-house CSA, and we have uh, hundreds of guests a year, so we feed everybody out of the, out of the gardens. Um, so it's a little hard to say what percentage. Um, we do still buy some things because we don't have a huge amount of agricultural land here. We still do buy grains and things that take larger plots of land, but we do produce most all of our vegetables. We have a, a root cellar for storing lots of things. We dehydrate, can, freeze, all kinds of food like that too. If we weren't having hundreds of visitors and we were feeding just the people who live here on the land, I would say we would be getting most of our vegetables from the food that we grow here. Okay, this is our cob oven built out of sand, clay, and straw. And it's a pretty uh, standard thing. It's used in a lot of other countries. And basically, once you heat this up um, and get it really hot with the wood fire thing, you can bake a pizza in here in a minute and a half. And you usually, two or three times a year, we have big, huge pizza ovens. hundred people come and we crank it pizzas in and out. And this was built by one of our members. 
we actually found the stones on the land, cut them all out, and built the whole thing, and built a nice roof over it. So it's, a, it's just a nice way to uh, cook with, uh, more sustainable, because you can use wood, and wood, if it's harvested at the right rate, can be harvested at a sustainable rate from the forest. And we get a lot of our wood from uh, different sources um, in a sustainable way. And health enhances the health and the vitality of the forest to do some cutting of trees. And we usually, when we cut the trees, we meditate with the trees first. We don't just go out and cut them down. We, we talk to them, we uh, appreciate them, give thanks for their presence here. Well, supposedly you can harvest wood from a forest at a sustainable rate of about one half to three quarters of a cord of wood per acre per year without dimin ever diminishing the forest. So, you know, taking wood and using it, it can be a good thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a negative impact on the planet. Uh, seven to eight, eight years, they keep producing mushrooms two or three times a year. And shiitakes are really good. They stimulate the immune system. They are overall healthy. And uh, you can grow a lot of food just on these logs. No when we think about all the things that we get from trees, it's pretty amazing. Food and fuel and building materials, and it just goes on and on, the, the number of things that trees provide. So I think as long as it's done in a conscious way, that you're really appreciating the trees, and you're cutting them down in a way that doesn't create environmental or ecological um, imbalance or disaster, that uh, it's okay to use the trees. And the forest here is kind of friendly. I think they appreciate it. This particular piece of land was um, sacred to Native Americans. There's some hearth stones. There are these uh, stone hearths that were built supposedly at the uh, end of the Native American longhouses. And the uh, person who used to be head of the local historical society she said she thought that the Native people used to come here and do their ceremonies on the land. They didn't actually live here, but they would do uh, ceremonials here. And we found three of these hearth stones on Sirius's property. And then there's uh, three, two or three other ones that we found that were just outside of Sirius's property. And we had an old land grant deed from King Philip, who was actually an Indian, a Native American. Um, and they called this hill Hearthstone Hill way back when. So it has that whole history to it. So we felt, we feel that it is kind of a sacred space. And we've really tried to honor that. And we're really, um, there's a whole sections of land that we will not develop at all because we feel they're really sacred. And there are other areas that we feel we can work with them and actually make them more beautiful. Uh, part of our philosophy is never to build on a sacred part of the land. If something's already beautiful and has that sort of sacred energy, then um, not to build on it. And take areas of land that may be seemingly less desirable and make them beautiful. That's part of what we've tried to do here. And there's only, a, there's a large portion of land that we don't do anything with because we feel like we really need to preserve it and honor its sacredness.